Hi there. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tinnitus TV. Today, I am talking to the Watchmen. These veteran Canadian rockers are finally back on music fans' radar, and in more ways than one. First and foremost, the Winnipeg-born band just released a 25th anniversary edition of their 1998 disc Silent Radar, which expands on the original album with dozens of great demos, rough mixes, alternate takes, live recordings, and other unreleased goodies. But that's not all. The long-running quartet, who continue to play a few shows a year since reuniting in 2010, recently announced upcoming gigs in Toronto, Calgary, and their old hometown. With the deluxe edition of Silent Radar out now, singer Daniel Graves and guitarist Joey Serlin got on the Zoom to talk about making the album, preemptory head shaving, coming second to the tragically hip, and covering that dead guy with bad teeth and a hat. Enjoy. Daniel Graves, Joey Serlin from The Watchmen, thanks for taking the time to talk to me tonight. It is a pleasure to uh, have you both here. Thank you for having us. Nice to see you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we are here to talk about the new uh, reissue of Silent Radar. 25 years. I mean, does it feel like 25 years? Uh, well, you know, I, I was thinking about this. Uh, it, it feels like a long time ago, the, the, the process of it, but, uh, but the songs are so, are, are, are so close to, well, to me, and I'm sure to all of us. They just they feel like they're they're they've been in my back pocket or in our back pockets for for forever. But the process seems seems yeah. uh, you know a long time ago. <laughs> so and you, Joe? Yeah, I would. I think that's a good description. Um, I went through the process of kind of file checking everything at our studio that Universal had sent over, and it. it took you down memory lane. It helped help me remember what that process was. And it was, it was, I think it was a good time creatively in terms of the band's chemistry. I think uh, we we're pretty on point, as they say. That was, uh, some people describe it as our peak and it might've been I, creatively, I thought. Um, yeah, it's, uh, but it feels, like a, it feels like a long time ago, but in some ways it feels like yesterday, but I know. It's I mean, I guess it helps that you guys are still playing too. So, I mean, these songs are still, you know, somewhat current and still live in, in, in your set and all that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. So it's not just a nostalgia, you know, thing for you. Um, I gotta say though, you guys, you guys look good for 25 years on. I mean, you know, I think it's cause you were smart enough to go for the preemptive baldness thing, you know? Oh yeah. Danny talked me into that. He, he, uh, he smart got me. Cause you yeah, know, he... Sam's all gray. And, and yeah. I mean, last time I saw Ken, he was full Grizzly Adam, so yeah. you know you guys, you did well. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. I, I I talked my dad into doing that too. He was holding on to like the last few pieces of hair, and I said, "Dad, just take it down to the wood, and you're gonna look." And now he looks like he looks like a a bad hundred and five, and he's <laughs> he's eighty two or something. So uh, yes, I think uh, I agree. It was a it was a wise move. Uh huh. Uh huh. So you mentioned you mentioned Universal sending over. Uh, did they have all of this stuff, or did some of was some of it from your own personal collections in terms of the the, the old mixes and the unreleased stuff? I think Sammy had some of it. Um, Sammy's always kind of been the, the keeper of all those things. Um, and I got then the sense uh, I got the sense Sam was kind of the band's archivist. He is. Yeah, not the way to say in it. He just kind of took it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there yeah. you're still trying to get back from him? Is that? Uh, I just would it be okay if I please listen? No, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when you got all this stuff from from various sources, uh, you know, listening to it again, I mean, obviously, like we talked about, you guys are still playing the songs and all that, but. I mean, I'm I'm guessing you're not the kind of guys who, you know, after work on a Friday, sit down with a with a drink and listen to all your old albums. So you probably oh. hadn't, you know, physically, you know, put this on the stereo and and paid attention to it for who knows how long. What was it like in that sort of first moment of going through all this stuff again and listening to it with fresh ears after all this time? Well, you kind of touched on when you said, well, you've been playing these songs. Yeah. Um, and they've been in our set, but some of them hadn't. And I don't know why some of them make that 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 cut where they come with you for years and years and some get left behind. Maybe it's just how they translate from 
you know, uh, the, the recording process and some don't lend themselves as well to being played live. I'm not sure, but um, some of the songs that had didn't make that journey with us, I found myself, I found, I found an appreciation for them because I hadn't heard them in a long time. Um, and then there's the four songs that were the outtakes and you could call them like kind of half baked because they weren't as fully realized as some of the other songs, but I thought, wow, these are really good. I actually was wondering why they didn't make it onto the album. Because yes. um, it was such a, after Brand New Day, it was, it was a very different process where Brand New Day was very impromptu in the studio and written in the studio. We, we decided to be really prepared for this one. It was kind of imperative as far as our career went. And we actually, Dan, you can jump in, but in a way we recorded the album twice. We did it in Toronto and with a producer, Matt DiMatteo, and hearing what we did uh, um, in, in, in that recording process compared to where we netted out with Adam Casper in Seattle, that was very interesting. Um, very different takes and they it's sort of some great stuff that we had done with Matt. And then we, and then for me to hear the unmixed stuff, which was kind of faders up on all the guitars that were on there and all the parts that I'd written and <laughs> recorded and I don't know what happened to them, but <laughs> some of them didn't make it, but it, yeah, it was really neat. It was like a time trip. It definitely was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I bet. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I look at the, uh, I mean, I, I sort of have a <clears throat> maybe maybe more, more of a drone approach. I just I think about because I remember that I drive by that uh, that the studio presence presence sound where we did that stuff at King and Strong with uh, with Matt DiMatteo. and and uh, and and I also think that that from Brand New Day because we came off in the trees and in the trees was <clears throat> was our only was our only platinum uh, selling record. And, and so I, I, I just, my, my sense or my half memory is that we, we kind of felt like we could do no wrong. And so we said, oh, let's say we can do anything, you know, like you just sort of, so we, we went in with Brand New Day and we tried a whole bunch of new, new things. And I'm really proud of that record as well. But I, I think that, that Silent Radar was, was sort of an answer to that because Brand New Day didn't do as well. We weren't, we weren't the hot shots we, we thought we were maybe. And and it really felt like the the process for Silent Radar and like you said, Joe, like a, a pivotal moment um, in our sort of record making process. It it, it felt really uh, it felt really important to take you know the extra time and 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 really try and hit it out of the park. And and I I don't know I, I feel that we did you know in in uh, in a lot of ways. And you know but it, 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 it proven by the fact that. A lot of those songs we play every night, you know, or whenever we play with it, where they're always in our sets. And it's uh, that's, you know, the cream rises to the top, you know. Right. Ta talking about the songs um, in terms of songwriting, do you remember what was sort of uh, inspiring you, where your heads were at uh, and what you were trying to say with a lot of this material at the time? Yeah, well, I mean, Danny, I think you wrote a lot of lyrics on that album. I wrote some of them. Um, one song, um, Any Day Now, is about Winnipeg and and kind of that return home that I remember flying in, taking a, a late flight, coming in by myself in Toronto. Um, actually, I think it might have been um, some pre-pro for the album, pre-pro sessions where we were convening in Winnipeg, and I wrote that, the lyrics, when I got back to my parents' house because I was staying with them. Um, I think for it was a lot of... For me, it was, and even Danny, some of your songs that, that you wrote that I relate to, we were coming, reaching an age where that kind of that feeling you have when you're in your early twenties, where you feel like invulnerable and immortal um, was kind of fading and we were transitioning into adulthood. And we were starting to go through, th through some realities and some of the people we loved and cared about were we started to lose friends and things like like people were dying and passing away and some of those concepts made it to the album so i think in a lot of ways it was like a turning point in terms of just maturing as 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 men and as people hmm. yeah no, I, I agree with that i i think about um i think about stereo and and brighter hell particularly and i'm sure there are more and joe you can maybe fill me in on this because it's it's vague but uh 
your uh, Eric uh, Eric Korn had a had a that studio on uh, Beverly and Queen. Remember that that. Yeah. that yeah. yeah I, I, I remember I remember stereo and brighter hell coming together in that so I mean I guess the 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 I, I, I just sort of think sort of like where like where physically we were at it's like oh yeah like because whenever I because now it's a huge condo and you know the Phoebe condos or whatever but but mm -hmm. I, I think about uh, I just I think about where they started and and just I remember you know, saying the line, my life is a stereo in that room with, you know, Eric on the other side of the glass. And, and we were in this, it was like a, you know, a, an old, an old style kind of big brick building destined for demolition. And I just, I remember being there uh, doing that. So it just sort of like locationally, I, I think about, you know, where, where we were when, I, you know, where I was when I, when I said that line, Joe, where you were when you, when any day now came to be, you know, so the, the, those are the, those are the feelings that I have when I, when I think about, uh, when I think about the, just how this record came to be. And, and, and I think it, it culminated, sorry to interrupt you, but we were so prepared because we were so determined not to mess up. So we were, it culminated with the actual recording at Studio Litho. Um, and Brighter Hell is a good example. Uh, and Adam Casper maybe was the perfect person to capture this. It was really very much the four of us mm -hmm. live on the big floor, yep. a little bit of isolation, but there was not a lot of multi-tracking and some of them two to three takes and we were done mm -hmm. because we were so prepared and ready. And I remember particularly Brighter Hell um, was a very special moment. I think when we recorded it and then <laughs> We finished recording it and that last night was holding, we're all kind of sitting there looking at each other. And then I think you can still hear it on the album. You can hear this RF because I was playing a, a Strat. You can hear some weird fifties TV show or, or radio show, where it used to be, <laughs> like a detective show coming through my amp and we kept it and it's on the album. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned feeling uh, determined um was was that pressure you were kind of putting on yourselves or was there external pressure as well because i mean at that point it seems to me you guys were still on on the ascent you know but you hadn't quite really broken so yeah. you know was there kind of this this sense of it's 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 a do or die kind of moment it was just for me artistically i think mm -hmm. um commercially yes obviously that's how we were living at the time and that's how we survived. And there is some pressure, I think, commercially because we changed record companies. We'd gone from Universal to EMI at the time. And so they invested heavily and there was expectations. Um, but for me, it was mostly self-imposed. I just wanted to really kind of get it right and get back to how we used to do things. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I, I think, you know, again, with, uh, you know, again, having having a record, having having one record answer the record previously, uh, and I'm and don't get me wrong, I'm bringing this up again, but I'm I'm very proud of the of all of our records, but I I just I recognize that that brand new day was was we it felt like we were kind of taking a bit of a chance, I guess, and 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 really this is all this is all in retrospect, um, but but we we all sort of came to the table and realized yeah we're gonna this is a new record company and we're gonna show these guys what we got and we had a lot of cheerleaders behind us uh like high up in the company and um and it was yeah it was a big deal but i, I agree i probably self-imposed because we because we knew as well we knew that all right this one wasn't this one wasn't what in the trees was the brand new day wasn't what in the trees was let's get back to to sort of, you know, really, really, you know, dialing in and, uh, and, and coming to the table with, with the strongest stuff that we had. Yeah. One, one of the things that surprised me about this is that, you know, typically with a lot of these uh, reissue sets, they just toss in, you know, a handful of demos that sound exactly like the, the finished songs on the album, or maybe some alternate takes that, again, are, are you know, pretty indistinguishable and then yeah. they toss in some 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 you know maybe a live set from from the album tour and that's it but i mean with the stuff you've got on here you know you've got the unmixed stuff you've got those demos um you've got the sort of uh, alternate takes uh 
and, and it it really is is like a, a, a adds a whole new dimension to you know the album and and I I have to be honest to you with no disrespect to to Adam Casper or, or anybody else I kind of like the the raw early versions a little bit better in some ways you mm -hmm. know they have they have uh, that sort of um, raw oomph yeah. you know? I know I I kind of felt the same thing yeah. uh, and maybe it's just because. I hadn't heard it in so long. So, and maybe sometimes just a different spin on it can be refreshing. So therefore it's more exciting, but I listened to it with one of our engineers at work who actually is the same co-producer engineer that did uh, the album for Danny and I for the Searle and Graves album. And we we're listening to it and we we're looking at each other going, this is really good. Like the guitar sounded great. The drums were great. Is, that, is, that, the, is that the Matt, the, the Matt to Mateo? Matt stuff, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was really the guitar tones were great. I, like everything. Yeah, I, I I can't disagree with you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, I think like say, it's not a knock on Adam because obviously no, it worked and <laughs> it did. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. No, it's just I think I think yeah. it's the, maybe my point was it's a it is a real treat I think for the, for the fans because again it's not just getting three and four versions of the same song that sound identical to one another. You know, there's really a lot you can dig into here. Yeah, I was apprehensive at first. Uh, once again, Sammy initiated all this probably because he had access and had maybe pulled it out. Maybe he does listen to our stuff on Friday nights. So I don't know. But um, he he said, we have some really good stuff here. And I said, listen, I, 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 I had a bit of a misunderstanding. I thought they were just like, to your point, alt mixes, like vocal up versions or different. Right. Like, no, yeah. but this is legit different versions, different recorded in different places with different different amps and different yeah. engineers and yeah well, and, and also a, a whole set of songs that like they said like songs that didn't make make the cut like there are some tunes that it's like god i have no memory of of that of that's like of that song or yeah. or coming or or no i have just had just not knowing where where it came from you know yeah, i wouldn't know how to play it yeah well absolutely and i'm but i use a lot of weird alternate tunings and <laughs> I, I i don't think i could do it <laughs> yeah, no it, it's it's re it's really neat and and you know it's a it's you know again as you said joe it's a, it's a real memory lane thing because it it's a piece of time and it puts you back in that time and you think okay well why didn't this song make it and 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 there's no good reason for it because there's a lot of good stuff there we just didn't we didn't push we, we couldn't push with all of them. They, they always say like when you're, when you're picking songs for a record, it's like, it's like drowning kittens, you know, cause you love them all. Yeah. You love all 20 of them, but, but you can only put on 12. So you have to sort of figure it out. And yeah, well, I don't even know how that process went, but. Uh, well, you probably just trust in your producer and. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Objective it, opinion, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, 75 elementary and you are three of those, mm -hmm. those songs. And I mean, yeah, those are, those are every bit as good as anything that's on the album. And it's amazing that, that they slipped through the cracks, you know? Yeah. I really, I, tr I truly believe maybe we thought they would make it on the next one or something, you know, and then you yeah. just you move on. I have an idea. I yeah. mean, I know this, this is coming out digitally only. So yeah. take those things. For now, for now it is. For now. <laughs> know, for now. Okay. So take those, yeah. put them on an EP, get it out. there. <laughs> New album. Yeah, or yeah. or new EP, new album. Yeah, yeah. That's, All right. Well, I'm not opposed to it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not opposed. It's easier to than it. writing new songs, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Much easier. Uh, speaking of speaking of, of cracks, I mean, this ended up being your last album, obviously, before Sam went off. Um, mm -hmm. Were there already kind of were the cracks already sort of starting to show in the in that regard when you were making this, or or did that all happen afterward? Kind of happen. I felt like we were in a pretty good unified place while we were making the album. Like we kind of, we kind of parked it, whatever was starting to brew. Um, and then, but somehow we were very like-minded of the same mind. Like uh, we had our highs and lows on, on a personal level and how we got along and various degrees with various members. But there was always, well, there was always a very unified goal when it came to the music and a lot of respect and a lot of chemistry uh, when we played together. And I think that's the beauty of that album. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I think, I think the, 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 a, a testament to how, how and why 
we're still we're still doing it. I mean, you know, like a a busy year for for this band now is like six or seven shows a year. You know, it's several weeks in between. You know, but but it, it is it is a testament to like you said like the 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 chemistry of like yeah when we're on stage and we're uh and we're we're in the place that we are now it uh we still do it and we're not doing it you know gratefully and thankfully we're not doing it to pay our bills anymore we're doing it because it's like god it feels good to get on stage you know and people still people still give a shit and and that i i'm so humbled uh, by that 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 people still come out and and pay way more than they used to pay to come and see us and and uh and that's a big deal for us and yeah. and i think the reason why we're still doing it because you know we used to this used to feed our families now now it's just fun and it feels like uh it feels like getting back to you know rehearsing in joey's basement with like with fake lights and playing <laughs> van halen songs or, or whatever you know so i don't um, think you ever played a van halen song with me well would, no it would not van halen. What's, <laughs> what's uh oh god i i can't believe i don't remember his name the he died the early the bad teeth hat gu guitar player oh steve ray vaughn steve ray vaughn yeah, yeah. we did i hope no one else describes him like that i i could have done better <laughs> could have said legend but uh, <laughs> just a legend that's it but it's true no you did do steve ray vaughn songs with me we did what was it nothing with the weather or something what was uh, it Ridiculous down the weather, down the weather, weather. and uh, I think maybe it was Love Struck Baby or Mary Had a Little Lamb. I can't it's, remember. It's, Joe was like, you know, he had like, you know, a huge, like enormously loud amps and and Your he, kids. Wanted, he wanted to play guitar solos. So it was like, all right, well, I'll sing. I'll sing this 30 seconds while while there's two and a half million minutes of solos. <laughs> and, 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 and one other, one other thing is because we, we would rehearse in Joey's, uh, the basement of his place and, and it was loud. It was loud. He, his amp was way, way bigger than it should have been. I, I think. Yeah, and, I didn't know. I had no. Yeah, but, and then his his mom always <laughs> used to his mom always used to turn the lights off and on when it was too loud because like his parents were upstairs, and the lights were always trying to watch Mash or something upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the lights were always the lights were always flickering on and off, so we were always too loud, and it was, uh, uh, well, a, a lovely memory, I guess. Yeah, what great parents you had though that that you know would let you do oh, that yeah. in the basement. I mean, that's that's very, the, very, yeah, very supportive. No, we, we we had a tremendous amount of support from from all of our parents across yeah. the board, financially and in and you know and in every way, uh, and probably couldn't have done it without them. I'm sure. No way. Yeah. Yeah, but talking about th that trajectory of a band, you know, when you start off in the basement and it's just fun and you guys have been lucky enough now to, to, to last and to keep it together to the point where it's, it's fun again, you know, um, there were probably a lot of years when you were in that bubble, though, were you able to have as much fun, you know, as, as you should have at the time or in hindsight, do you, do you sort of look back and go, man, I wish we could have, you know, enjoyed it more or, or done this or, or we should have, you know, done that or I don't know. How do you feel about about that looking back on it? Well, there's definitely a lot of great memories, but I wish I had been a bit more appreciative of it at the time. Like I wish I, like you kind of nailed it. You go back and you could do it over again. You'd realize how fortunate you are to be touring the world and playing shows and, but, uh, in the moment, it's also very, it's, it's grueling. It's, there's a lot, it's, it's mentally taxing, physically taxing, um, especially trying to tour Canada. In the winter? Geographical. Yeah, winter. Like it's, 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 it's definitely, you're risking your life to play rock and roll. It's like, uh, we had a lot of, a lot of near misses. Um, but yeah, I, I, but that, that all being said, hindsight allows you to really look back and think and a lot of amazing memories yeah yeah i i, I agree i i feel that um i i, I feel that I, I i didn't well exactly the same thing you said i i just i feel that i i appreciate what i've done like so much more now that i'm well a not doing it and not having to do it and to but it was just like it was amazing it was amazing we stayed in like this hotel in australia where like where the beatles stayed 
yeah, or not, where, where did I say Australia? Uh, like just like amazing, amazing memories of just just seeing the world and just saying, oh yeah, I'm just gonna go play a show and 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 uh, and Europe and 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 I just I do wish I mean, but I, I think it's kind of impossible because if you if you're always if you're in the moment doing it, it's just like you're working and it's just like okay, well I gotta pay my bills, I gotta do this, I gotta you know all that stuff, but then you realize, God, what what, what look look what I'm doing and look what uh, look what I, I've been able to do or we've been able to do uh, just by writing songs and making, you know, making something from nothing. Mm -hmm. We're also very much a one, especially in the early days, one fan at a time approach, like go play a city and then come back to it and keep adding to that fan base. And it was a lot, a lot of shows. And then you go away for three or four months and come home and you'd have a week before you go out again, you know, and it caught up to us a bit, you know, it's a lot of time spent together. Did either of you ever pick up the phone at home and, and try to order room service? <laughs> no, but I kind of realized at some point that nobody was gonna do my my laundry for me. <laughs> so to, talking about, about hindsight, 2020 hindsight, you guys were nominated three times for Juno Awards and lost to the Tragically Hip each time. Yeah, now, surprise. surprise. Yeah. <laughs> some might some might say that a smarter band would have taken to staggering their album releases into odd numbered years oh. so as not to be going up against the competition every time. I know you think that we would have clued in because we just literally set a chance. Nobody did, right? So yeah. yeah. It's yeah. funny you say that because I was thinking I was driving, I was getting my uh, my windshield replaced or or repaired today, and I was thinking. How many Junos have we have, were we nominated for? I was thinking. I think it was. I know it's at least one. You know, but then you said three, and I said, and then and yeah, we were on the same cycle as them, and we didn't stand a chance. And that's. I think that's where the phrase "it's an honor to be nominated." It's just such <laughs> an honor to be nominated comes from. <laughs> or I'm not in it for the awards. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, you know, we talked about you were joking about about new material, but I mean, you guys did the uh, did the album in 2021 that was kind of kind of got lost in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, are you are you working on anything else together or or do you have any other projects on the go that we should talk about? Not currently. No, I've written a few songs. Um, very proud of that album. Yes, it certainly got lost in the pandemic. And I, I, to me, that was uh, Danny. It was a, a really nice experience of f being able to record and timestamp some songs that have been around for a while and some new new songs as well for both of us. Um, uh, I didn't get to do as many shows as we would have hoped, and but um, we hope to uh, go out and maybe support it a bit more. Danny and I are wanting to do some uh, Acoustic shows that would be some of those songs and some Watchmen songs and some of our favorite songs that kind of inspired us to get into this in the first place. Um, but I'm not sure. I will write songs and we'll see what happens. Maybe, maybe we'll do it with the band. Maybe we'll do it with us again. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel the same way. I, I uh, I'm, I'm living a little north of the city uh, now, and I, I finally have. Uh, last time I had a piano in my house, I was 13 years old. I got it as a bar mitzvah present. And now, so now 40, now 20 years later, I, I have a <laughs> piano in my, <laughs> in my, in my house again. And I've been playing, I play every day and it's, and it's awesome. Like old songs and working on new stuff and, and, uh, it, um, it, it's it's sort of like like we like we said like now it's it's like playing Watchmen shows where we're doing it for fun and doing it for the reason why we started in the first place and not and not to to pay the bills or to feed the kids or to or whatever you know and so uh, I I would I would never say I would never say no to any any you know future whatever whether it lives in Watchmen world or or Serlin Graves or solo on anyone's standpoint about by anyone's standpoint so uh yeah it's exciting it's exciting i'm, I'm looking forward to what uh what tomorrow brings <laughs>